Hello and welcome to Switzer TV Property. I'm Peter Switzer and this week we talk to one of the country's smartest property players, Margaret Lomas of Destiny Financial Solutions, on how property investors should be playing the coronavirus. Is it run away, run away, or do you go looking for deep value with the market scared stiff for the Victorian lockdown and could it spread to New South Wales and even beyond? We then talk to Greg Sugars of Preston Row Patterson, their valuers, and I'm going to asking what's going to happen to Victorian property prices. Does it have to be a disaster for all property players? And then we talk to Federal MP Liberal Tim Wilson who thinks his government has to change things to make sure young people can get into property because his party thrives when home ownership thrives. He has a new book that tells us how we can get more young people into property called The Social Contract Renewing the Liberal Vision. Tim's afraid if the young don't own homes, they will go as far left as the Greens or even further left as some in the USA are going right now. Well, with Victoria locked down, the question is, what impact is it going to have on investing in property? And generally, the coronavirus has had an impact on lots of investment properties. So to talk about that, Probably the country's most foremost expert on these sorts of things, Margaret Lomas, has joined me on the program. Hi, Margaret. Hi there. So what are you telling your clients about buying investment properties right now, Margaret? So I guess the first thing that we need to do when we talk about whether it's a good time or a bad time to buy an investment property is to consider what we're really talking about in terms of impact. Um, you know, nobody really knows what the impact of a pandemic is because the last time we had a pandemic in the country, I don't believe that investment property was really a thing. Um, you know, people were doing it way back for the mm. Spanish flu. So I think it's very difficult for us to establish what the actual impact is going to be. But we also need to ask the question about whether or not there is going to be any real long-term impact because if we think about it the pandemic is here now and it's had an effect on businesses and our um, employment situation but the fact there are a few facts that still remain the first one is that we still have the same population we still have the same number of people needing to either buy properties or rent properties and so many of the driving forces of growth in property still exist but at the present moment they're masked and subdued as masks excuse the pun yeah, and subdued nice pun. <laughs> because people aren't doing anything at the moment because we're just holding our breath and waiting to see, you know, what happens. We're waiting to see whether our relatives are going to get COVID, whether we're going to be in lockdown again here in New South Wales or not. So, so that's the first thing that I want to say about investing in property. Does that mean that I'm telling people not to invest right now? No, it doesn't. But what it does mean is that I'm suggesting to property investors that we need to think about all of those things that typically drive growth in property and work out which of those things are going to be the most likely to be short term, medium term and long term affected by a pandemic today. Yep. Okay. So I'm, my next question is, is kind of uh, related because uh, there's an issue there of oversupply of apartments, particularly in CBD areas and, and probably in holiday going areas as well because of Airbnb problems and those sort of apartments that were Airbnb are now being put onto, onto the, the full or long-term leasing market or renting market. Now that has a, an impact on the potential returns of um, those people who were just simply trying to buy an apartment as a property investor for the long-term rental market. How are you yes. dealing with that? Yeah, so that now flows on from what I said in response to your first question. You need to think about whether or not um, which of those growth drivers are going to be the most affected by this pandemic. So first of all, long term, we will come out of the pandemic. Hmm. And when we come out of the pandemic and we get back to a better rate of unemployment, then I perceive that the situation will go back to relatively normal with the typical growth drivers affecting whether or not property is going to grow. So that means that the next thing that you think of as a property investor is, what are my needs for the immediate, let's say two to three years, and how does the pandemic affect what I'm going to buy? And what you're saying is correct. 
The pandemic most likely for now is going to affect a number of things. First of all, the apartment market in our most affected capital cities, which is Melbourne, of course, and to a lesser degree, Sydney. And because both of those cities were already oversupplied for the present moment with those apartments, with a view to that oversupply working itself out within the next five to seven years, so remember that, that five to seven years, that oversupply was going to be working itself out. But for now, it's still there. And on top of that, we now have a pandemic, which means a couple of things. First of all, a lot of people are going back home because they're losing their job and they can't afford to rent anymore. So the rental market has opened up and rents have dropped. Add to that, a lot of people who have Airbnb who aren't getting anyone staying in them are now long-term leasing or trying to long-term lease their properties. And therefore, the pool now or the oversupply of rentals has become massive. So for a property investor, the problem becomes that while you might buy a property that can grow over time, once we come out of the pandemic and once the oversupply is gone, I suspect that an apartment investment from a capital growth point of view will still be a good investment. Can you stand the lack of income to get to there? Mm. And are you going to lose so much that even good growth isn't going to pay you back? And so they're the questions that you would ask as, as an, an apartment buyer. Yeah. If I was buying an apartment as an investor at the moment, I wouldn't be buying it in Sydney or Melbourne. And I guess if you were going to buy in Sydney and Melbourne, you'd be buying areas that are, uh, have no relationship with Airbnb, um, are, are always going to be in demand for Melbourne and Sydney workers to want to live in, to go to work in, but you, you won't have those sort of variables that you're talking about that explains why there's oversupply. And look, can I also say that you and I always talk about property investors, but we need to talk about the property market because property investors don't necessarily have a huge impact on property markets and they certainly don't have a huge impact on all property markets because there are many property markets where we don't see a lot of investors moving in them hmm. and there are different levels of the property market where property investors move. At the moment, I think it's an excellent time for first home buyers in both Sydney and Melbourne who would be buying an apartment and who are presently renting just marking time. It's a fabulous time for them to think about buying at the moment because yeah. it's an almost perfect storm for them. We have exceptionally low interest rates. And while they're probably getting a pretty good and enviable rent on where they're renting, so their rents have probably dropped. And I know for a fact that many young couples who are renting have had their rents actually lowered in an effort to keep them in those apartments. But because there are so many apartments in Sydney and Melbourne that are being affected, and many of those investors need to get that return now. They need to get that income now. They can't wait until it's all over. There's some great buys going on apartments for those first home buyers. Hmm. Now, a couple of things they need to think about. First of all, a first home buyer will often look to build because they get that extra bonus um, first home buyer grants for hmm. a brand new property. But what you're going to save on one of these secondhand apartments is going to be way more than that extra grant that you're going to get. So it's worthwhile for going that for now. Mm -hmm. The second thing is you have to understand if that this is you, that there is a likelihood when you get into that property that you might see a further slight fall in value. But if you negotiate really well on the way in and you have a good look around and you try to get a bargain by finding a number of apartments and go for the one that's going to negotiate the best with you, it's likely you're going to come in significantly under today's market value when you buy in. So those further falls aren't going to be you that greatly. Margaret, where are the buying opportunities for someone who's a property investor and says, okay, well, I'm prepared to, to maybe cop low, a really low rent for a year or two, but when things go back to normal, I, I'll have the option of maybe Airbnb my, my place in, in Sydney or Brisbane or someplace like that where tourists always want to be. Are there any of those sort of buying opportunities out there that, yeah, the, the bit of a, the risk taker, the thrill seeker is prepared to have a go at, but eventually over time you think things will be okay? Let's make it clear that rents haven't dropped everywhere. Rents have really only been impacted mostly 
in those areas where we saw rents at probably the over 500 to 600 dollar mark where we do have that oversupply in a lot of airbnb mm. there's so many areas in australia today where we've got lower rents but they're good solid suburbs that have got a great prognosis for the future and we haven't seen a lot of impact on those rents. We haven't seen a lot of vacancy in those areas. Mm. We haven't seen people needing to ask for a lower rent because they're already on a low rent. Yep. And most of those people are affording that low rent, even on unemployment benefits. And so there are plenty of those areas. Now, if we go to Melbourne, the Cardinia Shire, which is just on the other side, the east side of Pakenham, is one of those areas that's now geographically, I guess, almost moving closer to Melbourne. We're seeing the geographical shift of the centre of Melbourne Melbourne move out around that narrow Warren area where we've got a lot of blue collar and middle management workers, lots of employment, the Monash um, precinct there, which is a huge employment hub and much closer to narrow Warren than it is to the, the city. Then we're finding that a lot of people are working there not having to commute to the city. Mm. So now we're starting to get that extension out through the Cardinia Shire. And there's a lot of affordable properties out there in um, the valley there, round where the coal mining used to be and people thought that those areas were going to shut down and you know be no good anymore like Taralgon as an example people are now starting to buy there buy older homes build new homes there a lot of developers are buying the big broad acre lots and starting to release land developments and they're quite affordable they're commutable and they're not being impacted at all by mm. this COVID in terms of their property values so that's one area that I really do like at the moment of course the northern suburbs, suburbs of Brisbane are always going to be one that I go for for simply because there's been no impact on all that great development that's happening up there with the university and the slow crawl toward the Sunshine Coast and the infill that's happening there. Mm. I think you're never going to go wrong by investing there, providing you're not out for that big massive gain the moment you buy and you're happy to sit and get a great five to six percent rental yield and sit for you know 10 or 15 years you'll get a good return um look perth has started a comeback and they're not being impacted well you know they've closed up their borders to everyone they're not yeah. living in or out and so traditionally in perth the investors who live in perth tend to want to buy in perth and they don't tend to buy widely like east coast investors do so they're becoming active in their market again and of course adelaide you know adelaide just does what it always does pandemics economic crises world wars Adelaide grows every year by a little bit and has great rental return. That's right. You always say it and it's true when you look at the numbers. Now, Margaret, what can a property investor do to avoid cracked buildings, panel problems and recessions? Well, look, that's been a really difficult one. And the unfortunate truth, even if you look at the figures, is that it's highly likely that in Sydney and Melbourne, up to 85% of all apartment buildings are impacted in some way by water ingress, cracked buildings, or they have flammable panels on the outside of them. So the best way to avoid getting involved in that is to not get involved in it and don't buy them. Hmm. If you really do want to buy an apartment, and my nephew's buying at the moment, and I've been helping him for the last couple of weeks, We've talked a lot about making sure that we don't have those panels. There's been things that um, he's looked at. He wrote to me and said, I found a great apartment today. We're a little bit worried that there seemed to be a little bit of mould around the window edges. And I said to him straight away, that's a water ingress problem. Steer away from that. Mm -hmm. So you really need to ramp up your due diligence and become educated about what are the indicators of these things. You know, you'll see cracks in walls that the agent will go, oh, no, that's a surface crack. Probably not. So you need to look for those internal cracks when you're looking. You make sure that the outside of the building is only concrete and there's not a single panel anywhere. I go for low rise rather than high rise because high rise typically have more of these problems um, and they're much harder to fix and much more expensive to fix. Look for any kind of mould, any kind of water anywhere, you know, turn on the taps and make sure the drains drain out really well and just up your due, due diligence to make sure that you really know what you're buying and pay for that really good building inspection. Mm, I'm going to ask you that question. Obviously, 
uh, paying for a building inspection is uh, an outlay you just have to do if you're going to be doing an investment like uh, a, an apartment in particular. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people don't get a building inspection done because they just assume that because strata means that you only own anything inside the paint, then they automatically assume, well, if there's a building problem, it doesn't matter because strata takes care of that. And I'm always stunned at how few people realize that they are strata. That's right. You can talk about strata as if it's this like big brother entity that controls everything and has all the money. You're the strata. You have a strata manager and you pay that strata manager, but you're the strata. And if there are any building concerns, you'll pay for it, whether it's out of the sinking fund or if there's not enough money there, a special levy. And I can't tell you how many people have bought into an apartment building and six months later, a major fault's been detected in requiring a big special levy to be raised that that person, either owner, occupier or investor, didn't budget for and just can't get their hands on. And it can be a really tragic financial consequence. And that's the reason why you need to be educated when you want to be a property investor. And a great place to go is Destiny Financial Solutions, founded by Margaret Lomas. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you. Well, everyone is clearly concerned about what's happening to Victoria generally and the property market specifically. To answer those questions, we have Greg Sugars, who's the National Director and CEO of Preston Road Patterson, who's involved in many areas of the, the property market, but in particular valuations. Greg, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me. So what's it like being in charge of a business like yours during this, these very, very uncertain times? Yeah, well, it is a bit uh, challenging at the moment. And um, I suppose that the, probably the key issue is getting your head around all the information that's probably not forthcoming from government levels at the moment, where we're struggling trying to keep uh, ourselves ahead of what's going on in the marketplace. Um, and we're very lucky that the Australian Property Institute's been very proactive with government. So that's um, been a, um, a real positive mm. and they've um, worked through to get uh, particularly valuers who are doing work in the banking sector and exemption to um, keep doing so loans can still get approved because as you know um, banks are using uh, the value of properties for security yep. but it's interesting times yeah so given that are real estate agents able to do what they normally do to to keep the the, the possibility of sales going as they yeah. normally do so they're doing things very differently. That they, they actually cannot conduct inspections. People can't go through um, property. So the only way you can view a property is online. Mm. Um, one would suggest that that over the next six weeks will be quite problematic because I don't think I'd ever buy a house just by looking at a picture on the internet. So, no, uh, you not, get, not in the age of uh, trickery. All the, all the cracks and uh, things like that. Yeah. <laughs> that way. So I think what we'll see is a huge. Um, closure of volumes or a, a shutdown of volumes through the market for the next six weeks. Um, institutional grade investments, you know, they sort of, a lot of those take a long time. Uh, there's long lead times in those. So there might still be transactions. Happening. But again, Peter, if you look at, you know, uh, who would be selling at the moment? Um, you know, what's the profile of a seller um, and why um, in a time like this? So, you know, we've got a few things that are, are really playing against the property industry, but Saying that, um, leading into where we where we've just got to in Melbourne, um, things have been okay. Mm. So, yeah, uh, you, you have to love the um, the uh, pioneering spirit of Australian property buyers, aren't they? But yeah. but but in your case, you know, working out the value of a property, you know, you, there there isn't a textbook you can go to where you look at look at uh, up the index and go PPP, uh, P -P 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 oh, pandemic. Yeah, this is the yeah. this is the way this is the way we do valuations in yeah. pandemic. So so really, are you are you assuming that you've got an established valuation for a house in a particular area, and then you're trying to work out some kind of discount based on your best guess? Yeah. Uh, so we never say we guess in the valuation. Of course industry. not. Of course, sorry. <laughs> How dare I suggest that word? Yeah, mate? yeah. <laughs> but I think Peter. One of the things is, um, look, there is for for valuers the international valuation standards councils come out with a bit of a uh, a playbook for what we call valuation uncertainty. And 
same thing came into place after the GFC because um, obviously we had the same technical issues um, in that marketplace. But for housing stock, for example, um, you know, there are still transactions happening. Um, and we saw what happened after the last stage three lockdowns that the market kept going. Um, I think CoreLogic came out the other day and said in Melbourne there'd been a, a you know a quarterly a monthly drop for the last couple of uh, months, but year on year it was still up. And um, I also saw an article by one of the economists saying he thought things might you know fall by 20 20 percent, which again the doomsday is always have a have a real real red hot crack. Yeah. Probably the part of the market that we're most concerned about at the moment, commercial retail, um, not so much industrial. Industrial has been going on really well, but um, retail already had some structural issues before even, you know, February. Um, and it's probably exacerbated by the way that rents are being treated for tenants. Um, we've got some real concerns that uh, the way that the legislation uh, is uh, written for um, you know, the way we do the commercial code of leasing is that um, there's a period, uh, half of that uh, discount is a deferment. And um, is that ever going to be repaid to the landlord? And obviously, we know commercial property trades on um, cash flows. Mm. So, um, you know, there's not a lot of evidence in the market to say that um, at the moment that things are happening. But we all know uh, as professionals that there are some structural issues and we can see if you go down the, the main street the chapel street in melbourne or uh some of those we know that some of those shops will never reopen those landlords will never get that cash flow back in in the short term yep. and there'll be long leasing up periods before they can get that cash flow so of course what will happen is that an investor will then discount back that value based on that lack of cash flow mm. well let me make, give you a, a really easy question greg because you know you're, you're a man who can do these sorts of things Let's, let's imagine I do own a shop in Chapel Street, Paran. Great, yeah. a great shopping precinct, but you know things have been challenging. Um, I bought it, say, for two million dollars um, a couple of years ago. If I put this on the market now as a valuer, and just say it's one of those conventional shops, there's lots of those little conventional shops in uh, Chapel Street, Paran. You know them, I know them. Yep. What, what do you reckon they'd be selling for now? Um. So uh, our best our best estimates would be that the yields will have blown out a little bit, um, but based on the and of course the yields based on the rent. So say the rents come back thirty percent, hmm. and the yield blows out a percent, maybe a percent and a half, um, then we'll probably see that shop of two million dollars. It might be worth you know one one point two million dollars at the moment. One point two. Yeah. 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 That's a that's a big drop, isn't it? And yeah. so it, yes. if you're the lender to that person. Yes. Um, and, you know, and, and you, you maybe borrowed on 80% or 90%. Um, um, LVR, yeah. LVR. Uh, the, the bank would be saying, gee, we hope this lockdown, yeah, <laughs> this right. coronavirus leaves town yeah. pretty soon or else we're going to be yeah. pretty tough on that, yeah. on that think, uh, borrower. Yeah. And I think, Peter, probably one of the, the probably things we've got really going for us in this market, even despite all the challenges that we've got, we're, it's it's a really different environment than when we've had our last two big downturns in property. I mean, if I'm old enough to remember back 1991, um, interest rates at 18%. Um, you know, the bank were calling in loans because they couldn't afford for the interest to capitalise. You know, most of my job as a valuer in those days was going out and setting mortgage in possession <laughs> reserves yeah. um, for the banks. Uh, well, that's not there this time. We've got the record low interest rates. So um, there's a bit of wiggle room there. And I suppose after the GFC, there was just no availability of capital. And there is still plenty of private money as well as institutional money in yeah. the property markets at the moment. So structurally, it's quite different. So that's why I'm relatively confident that we'll move through this, subject to this lockdown not going on forever. Mm. <laughs> but, um, yeah. But Greg, do you also think that in some cases, the functions of a commercial property could be changed over time. Like, for example, you know, if if you if you owned a, a shop in Albert Park or someplace like that, you know, you, you may well be better off just turning turning the upstairs section into a, a high class uh, rental apartment. Oh, absolutely. Which absolutely. which has a, like you've changed the function, but people yeah. want to be in great suburbs like that, and similarly yeah. in Beaconsfield Parade near the beach and all those sort of things. 
th that's where you know, the owners are going to have to think about what is the best return on my, my invested capital. Yeah, we, we talk about in property, in particular in valuations, the highest and best use. And given the structural changes in the marketplace, some of those best uses will change back to, say, residential. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you look at even the way the markets, a lot of retail um, has been changing anyway. Even before this, it was going online. Mm. Um, shops were getting smaller. Um, the retail presence was changing. You just have to look at Chadston Shopping Centre in Melbourne. It's actually not a shopping centre, really. It's a destination for entertainment, you know, with food courts and Lego mm. land, all those theatres and all those sorts of things. It's Those sort of uh, changes were already happening. So um, this will um, probably speed along some of those changes, I would suggest. Mm. Yeah. So I guess the best case scenario for anyone who is an investor in property in Melbourne is uh, the lockdown ends ASAP, a vaccine comes along and normalcy comes down the road some, somewhere in the early months of 2021. Wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> My fingers are crossed. <laughs> yeah, well, you know I'm an optimist, Chris. Yeah, me too, me too. <laughs> so. All right, but if that doesn't happen, yeah. Give, it, give us the pessimistic so it, scenario. Yeah, so look, and, and I've got to temper this a little bit saying there are some sectors of the property market that are actually going really well. Hmm. I mean, as I mentioned before, industrials, because the distribution networks and logistics, because we're now doing everything online, it's really changed. The other part of the market, to be honest, is um, food security. So the rural sector, our rural valuers are saying that uh, the market in Victoria has probably never been better. You know, mm -hmm. so there's some interesting things. But if we go back to commercial office space, um, looking forward, say, okay, what are the requirements of people for office space now that everyone's been working from home? Um, yeah, that's going to be a re really interesting thing. I've already heard of a couple of big players with pre-commitments in Collins Street and the new buildings there saying, you know what, you know, we might have pre-committed to half a dozen floors, but we probably only need two now. Mm. Um, okay. So what will happen there typically is the really good A-grade buildings will, will remain tenant. They might change their rental levels, but they will re remain tenanted. But what happens at the other end of that is that the, the, the older office accommodation, um, the D-grade, C-grade, that'll start, we'll start seeing lots of vacancies in those. And that's where we might see, you know, these buildings, they'll be empty for a while. Um, and that's where we might see a change. They, they get uh, re, you know, demolished and something else built on the site. Mm, yeah. And, and I look, the, the interesting thing is, Greg, that sometimes markets need, you know, big kicks in the butt for them to, to change their functionality. But we all talk about the, the marvellous appeal of a New York apartment. Uh, yeah buried in Manhattan and place like that. Mm. A lot of those um, old office buildings in Melbourne could easily become fantastically expensive apartments because you know, when you take away the coronavirus, Melbourne is still, as you would argue, the most livable city in the world. Oh, absolutely. And I think probably the, the only caveat I'd put on that, Peter, is that it's going to have to have at least two bedrooms because uh, I think the people who are working from home in a one bedroom are <laughs> yes. probably struggling at the moment, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. P particularly if they've got a dog. All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Greg Sugars, thanks for joining us, mate. And we hope you Victorians can, can come out of lockdown ASAP. Thanks, Peter. Joining us now on the Switzer TV Property Show is Tim Wilson, MP for Goldstone. And Tim, you've got a new book out called The New Social Contract. And you, you basically say that you know, the generations, baby boomers and millennials have to ultimately uh, come up with a new contract that's probably fair on millennials and might mean that baby boomers have to give up a little bit from what they've currently got. But you, the bottom line is you'd like to see more younger Australians have access to property. Is that a fair call? That is a fair call because uh, private or well, people owning their own home uh, has obvious self-benefits, self-evident benefits from you know, having an environment for security for your family and yourself to be able to go on and prosper. It's uh, the primary vehicle that most Australians hold their own wealth. It's the most important asset for your retirement. Uh, it, people obsess about superannuation. The truth is if you don't have your own home, you're going to be much worse off even with super than if you actually have your own home. So. Having a discussion about the importance of 
uh, your own home is critical for the future of the country. Mm. But the other reason is something that's more philosophical, but does inform your decision making in life, is that it means you've actually got an investment in the existing society. And there's, you know, if you really want to go back and look at it all the way back to the French Revolution, uh, there's been discussions about why people owning their own home or their own property gives them an investment in the status quo, which means they have an interest in conserving society and holding society together. Mm. And what we know is that young Australians are buying their homes less because they can't afford to. Uh, in fact, in just about every single age group, there's a, a decline quite rapid uh, in home ownership, except for the top economic quintile of people over the age of 65. Mm. I totally agree with the French. Property owners are very nice people. Now let's go. <laughs> now let's go to what is really controversial for you, because you well know, and I well know, on May 18 of last year, one Bill Shorten brought up two issues that are related to everything you're talking about: negative gearing, and uh, and and uh, franking credits. Uh, and both of those were pretty important to uh, guarantee that you're currently an MP. How, is this something that you think needs to be looked at over time? Well, I, I think any issue around tax needs to look holistically because one of the big challenges we've got with tax generally is that uh, uh, most of the tax of the country is paid on income and that's principally people between the age of 35 and 55 and most of the areas of expenditure, the benefits of the tax and transfer system is increasingly going towards people over the age of 65 for pensions, aged care, health care, and the PBS at the most expensive time of your life. But when it comes to uh, the specifics, I, I think the whole discussion around negative gearing personally is a first thing um, because all negative gearing um, says is that you don't pay ta taxes on losses. And so, I mean, it's a, I personally think it's a pretty weak investment strategy, obviously very high in security, but it's absurd to think that people would pay tax on their losses. Um, and the same discussion around refundable franking credits, I don't think that's a, a constructive dialogue, at least because people have made very important financial decisions about their retirement security behind it. The key point of the book, the new social contract, is talking about well, how do we have these conversations where we can all go forward together, acknowledging that young people need opportunity and older Australians need financial and health security. Mm. But, but Tim, excuse me for being an economist with, uh, right. with accounting inclinations. The bottom line is a lot of people who've ended up in investment properties uh, think that they're paying a large amount of tax and they think, okay, well, let's get the tax man. It's, I hate to be sexist, but that's why they always call it the tax man is a tax man. And uh, th let's get him to help me pay off this apartment. And uh, one day this apartment, which I'm buying for a million, will sell for two million, so I'll get capital gain and I'll reduce my tax bill. And that, that has been one of the strong arguments. Now we know some people lose out because they buy crummy apartments and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But there are a lot of people who have actually built their wealth by doing that. Do you propose to try and make that less attractive down the track? Well, well I, there are two fundamental things I think we need to do. I think we need to even out the tax system or the tax base. So, because the moment we have radically different taxes and tax applied. So, you know, 47% tax for people who are on the top marginal income tax rate, while you've got, for instance, the primary tax people over the age of 65 pay, which is the GST. So, and of course, you've got a difference between income tax and company tax. So you've got all these disincentives to structure things based on where they can get the best benefit. But the other big issue I think we need to confront is around the capital gains discount because capital gains, um, of course, is uh, the reward from holding capital or an asset. Mm. Now, I have no issue with people making capital gain whatsoever, but I think it needs to be more closely tied to the return people get on their labour because young Australians only have their labour, intellectual energy and skill to sell. That should not be taxed at a higher rate or a differential rate needlessly um, to simply holding capital because that entrenches and rewards existing interests. So it's about how do we even out that balance? Now, some people say, oh, you want um, income tax to go up to, oh, sorry, capital gains tax to remove the discount entirely. Now, what I want is a lower, broader, consistent rate of tax um, in terms of all economic activity to address the imbalance.
So do you want to hire GST, Tim? I have said consistently as part of a broader discussion, the GST should be part of it, uh, but it needs to be um, a levelling of the tax, not just for the GST, but also coming with changes to income tax, company tax, capital gains tax, etc. It's not about, I don't think you can have the conversation about one tax. You've got to have a discussion about what do we need to do to the whole system. Okay. Now, there's, there's an issue, I, I, I haven't read the whole book, so I, I can't say you, you've covered this. But part of the, part of the problem why uh, house prices are, are high in this country is that the supply of property is, is yeah. not high enough compared to the demand. And, yes. and, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've seen uh, calculations that one third of a, a parcel of land that's developed by a developer for a home one third of it goes off in various taxes to, to various governments. And so if we whip that all the, the, the tax take from various governments, we can reduce the, the, the cost of a, a, of a home and more people, younger people will be able to get into those sort of homes. Is that something you think we need to look at? Because it is so important, as you pointed out, why are we slugging people? We slug people to try and stop them from smoking, but we shouldn't be slugging them to get into properties, which we say is really good for both them and society. Uh, well, do we need to look at it resolutely? Yes. And this is why the discussion around stamp duty versus land tax uh, is critically important. Whenever you raise it, people sort of jump to uh, almost uh, uh, hysterical conclusions mm. because they worry that their house is going to be suddenly attractive tax. It hasn't. Uh, it's got to be measured and discussed as part of an incremental phasing if it's to go ahead. But what we know um, at the moment is that uh, a big part of the cost of a house is logically the land. Now, land has different prices depending on how much it is in demand. But at the moment, state governments have a deliberate incentive to delay release of land because it um, constrains the market, increases the price, and therefore increases the stamp duty that then is paid when they sell it off. Uh, and so um, as a consequence, young people are bearing a disproportionate, disproportionate burden of the cost of buying housing to underwrite the revenue base of state governments. That's why having a broader based land tax, depending on how it's done, can actually even that out and frankly remove a lot of the barriers for young people and lower the prices uh, for purchasing of land. So, uh, it absolutely needs to be part of the conversation. It's not the only part of the conversation, but it would both decrease land prices and, of course, reduce the overall cost of housing for everybody. Okay, but there's also another sort of social development, and I blame young people like you for this, Tim, and I don't blame you for doing it, but there's what I call the Manhattanization of cities, that young people like you, once upon a time, were happy to live out Broad Meadows or, or um, uh, Rudy Hill or Penrith because they were young, they weren't wealthy and that's where houses are. But now they all want to be in the city, you know, in Paran and Pannington and Darlinghurst and all those sorts of places. And, and in a sense, you want to be where it's really expensive and it's a really great lifestyle. I don't blame you. But it's really difficult to jam all those people in unless they go into apartments. And of course, apartments are all falling apart nowadays when they build them too high. Well, I, I don't quite agree with your analysis. I mean, you're right about young people wanting to live in you know, highly dense urban areas. But yep. the question is why? And it's because that's where good paying jobs are. That's where lifestyle is. And I think one of the, the big errors we've made as a society around planning is to think that we should protect established suburbs and not allow any development. And there are certainly places where that is the attitude. But the trade-off is then you get more high density in other places. Um, and so you end up getting low and high density rather than having a much more rational discussion about what sustainable, community-focused, community-improving, medium density can occur in some parts uh, of, the, of the country, which can actually lessen those burdens and actually make our cities better. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's one of the great follies is if you don't have jobs out in rural and regional areas where there's cheap housing, then it can be great, but people can't go there. Uh, and then you've got to have development policies which actually encourage the development of job opportunities as well as housing stock to reflect what people can aspire to outside of the capital cities. Mm. Uh, because that will bring not just the benefits in terms of jobs, but also in terms of the culture and lifestyle 
and make us think, just frankly, a stronger country. Yeah. Well, one last one uh, on that same point. I, I know I was at Blackheath in the Blue Mountains recently, and I was thinking about so many people working from home nowadays and, and how expensive it is in Sydney. And I thought, well, yeah. if there was a very fast train from the mountains in the city, so it took no more than, say, 40 minutes to get from Blackheath or Katoomba into the city, yeah. a lot of people would love to live in Blackheath or Katoomba and places like that where you can buy a house for five or six hundred thousand dollars. But, you know, yeah. have governments been slack in, in really delivering what other advanced countries have like Japan? Even the, the POMs have got fast trains. We, we really have let ourselves down that respect, haven't we? Well, I don't agree, actually, because I, the assumptions sitting behind that is that we have these kind of regional centres or satellite cities all feeding into one hub. I think the more sustainable solution is to make the hubs their own cities and places where people want to live and, and work and get, get good paying jobs. Now, that's a challenge for the population. Everything that in Australia ultimately comes back to population. Uh, we can either have very high density cities and we can have subways and everything else. Uh, and then of course you can have um, high um, uh, fast rail uh, movements between capital cities. Um, but because we want to keep our cities, you know, modestly dense, at some point something has to give or it won't be sustainable. So. I think we're going to look at our rural and regional centres not just as places for people to live to feed into Melbourne. I think they've got to be seen as places that are viable to live in your own right because there are jobs, there are business opportunities and there are there's a lifestyle there that people want to aspire to mm. um, rather than just being a hub and a spoke. All right, Tim. Well, I hope uh, some of your uh, great ideas are actually uh, absorbed by your, your party and that one day we see the changes that are required. Thanks very much for joining us, mate. Thanks for having me.